God Loki, Teacher of Magic, Part 3 If Odin is called the father of mages, Loki is called the mother of witches. Indeed, you can encounter him under this Haiti. In one of the legends, not a particularly popular saga, but it does mention, it doesn't tell the entire story, but does mention that once upon a time, Loki ate a heart, a half-burned heart of a woman, and this act brought about the birth of all witches that exist in this world. Witches, whom Thor was actually fighting against, as they were the spawns of evil, as they were creations of the cunning-minded Loki, because every witch is an essence, an outcast. Every witch, she doesn't belong to any of the castes. She can be in all castes simultaneously, as well as not in any of them. She can freely move around between the castes, not getting hung up in any of them. Need to be a laborer? No problem. Join the rulers? Easy peasy. We can do it all. So, the classic description from the play, Macbeth, three witches making their brew. Yes, we've mentioned this sometime before, and how Macbeth himself went to them for advice, prophesies me, three sisters. Prophesize me power, and wealth, and everything else. Three priestesses of Hecate, in an asking fashion, bowing, he, the king, bowing before the witches. Always. Because in their hands is the WYRD of any laborer, any king, as well as any merchant and warrior, anyone. And they can turn into anyone they please. If needed, I pretend to be a maid. If needed, a queen, if it is needed. And if it's not needed, I will be in the woods by the cauldron, putting together all these terrible ingredients, together with sisters. So, witches are Loki's creation, who says, who you are is unimportant, you can be any one of them at any moment. Something else is important, not taking anything seriously. Once the seriousness begins, that's it, the end. If you are afraid to lose something, you are attached to that which you are so afraid to lose, and Loki will point it out for you. Do thank him if that happens. Don't forget to thank the God. Who else would show you your vulnerabilities? Who else would show you your protruding buttons? Buttons that someone will press for sure, no doubt about it. They'll find you. He is harsh and gentle at the same time. His harshness and love don't come through in words, but in his care. A care which he has towards the gods. And even in the fact that he brought them to the end, to say it harshly, brought them to Ragnarok, even in that, as strangely as it sounds, is a manifestation of his love. He gave them a chance to be saved. Because all did not come to an end with Ragnarok. What came was the rebirth of the word in a new quality, a better quality. And Balder returned from hell only after the Ragnarok, after making peace with Hod, meaning, when the darkness and light united together. In the world of hell, Balder changed from the god of good into the god of light. Meaning that he grew in status, from a patron god, to a ruler god. He became a ruler god only once he made peace with his killer, Hod. And this happened only once they found themselves in the womb of Mother Hell. Loki provoked the situation, made it happen that they both went there and experienced a transformation that is possible only through death. Only in death do we connect to our dark essence, to our shadow. We become inseparable from it, and the shadow gives us something that we wouldn't be able to receive in the world of the living. By killing Balder, he also resurrected him. 
As paradoxical as it may sound, he ended up dying in the process, Odin died as well, absolutely everyone died except for the new generation of gods and the Vanya gods, except for those who pledged allegiance to Asgard, that would be, Njord, Freyr, Freya, all of them have died, but the rest of the Vanya lived, as strange as it is. Despite Loki's dislike of the Vanya, he does understand that it all wouldn't be possible without nature. The young gods have survived, the children of Thor, of Odin, and Vidar, the silent Asir replaced Odin as the chief god of the new system, a new structure. We will be discussing it once we come to the subject of Vidar and the younger generation of gods. And all of that was provoked by Loki. They wanted Baldr to return, Baldr did return, only in a new quality. Could Baldr have developed himself without passing through death? without dying, by staying just as invincible and unchangeable? Never. And Loki knew that. He knew it as no one else. Loki the instigator, the provocateur of changes, the carrier of chaos, and only thanks to him the system has a right to be voiced here right now. Thanks to him the books have a right to be written, the runes have a right to be preserved. Because if that didn't happen, this magical system would have vanished just as quickly as say, the Slavic runes have gone, and that, too, used to be a mighty magical system, Folkovism. And just as many other magical systems have gone, and it's nearly impossible to restore the true essence of the Agama magical system, because that knowledge has vanished. Any system that wants to remain unchanged is destined to fail. If nothing changes within it, if good is rigid and remains unchanging, if evil doesn't ruffle it again and again, if it doesn't force it to grow, to develop, to learn, to transform any system would be doomed to fail. And the fact that, I repeat, we now have our Scandinavian subject as something possible to be learned, the fact that the sagas remained, and the fact that Snorri, despite all his Christianization, did write them down. And the fact that Simon the Wise wrote down his Elder Edda, and it reached us to this day in some kind of shape and form, and continues on popping up here and there in some strange manuscripts that appear as if out of nowhere in some random museums, in some storage, pop. A new saga is found that we didn't have before. It is translated, and they say, here it is, of course, this here is the missing link to the entire chronology of events. How many tales were found recently that, like small puzzle pieces, filled in the attitude, the character, and the algorithms of interaction of the gods with one another, as well as with people, but remember once again that Loki doesn't serve people, he sees in people a projection of a particular god, a god who once created you, and so his interaction with you would be the same as it is with that particular god. If it is Baldr, then it's Baldr. If it is Odin, then Odin. If it's Thor, then it's Thor. And if he sees Heimdall in you, then he will be ruffling your feathers, as he did with Heimdall, have no doubt about that. If he sees Tyr in you, he will pity you, feel for you, truly, genuinely. He will sincerely worry for you, just as he does for Tyr, and poke fun of you, as he did with Sif, and take jabs at you, as he did with Freya. Meaning, not because Freya is bad, but because that is who Loki is, because he is the way that he is. And what that means, he will show you himself. He will show you if he chooses to do so. And if you happen to feel his presence in your life, don't dare to forget the offerings. Because you would be extremely lucky if he happens to teach you. No one is able to point out our mistakes, our vulnerabilities in the way that he can God the mocker, red-haired, with a mouth sewn shut, with naked limbs, constantly running around the worlds, capable of everything, but never doing anything that would cause evident, actual harm, any harm that he brings, once tested, turns out to be an incredible benefit. Loki is the fifth, concluding channel of the organizer gods of the Scandinavian pantheon. When they unite together, or fuse together within you, Understandably that you would do to natural reasons give a preference to one of them. 
With that said, when this fusion happens you will to a greater degree understand Odin, and Thor, and Tyr, and Heimdall in their functions, their hypostases, because Loki closes up this five in an equalizing fashion. He is an integral part of the entire Scandinavian magic, of the entire Scandinavian pantheon. If there were no Loki, there wouldn't be what you and I currently have and so the closing of this entire five will allow you to see that he isn't just the shadow side of Odin, but also the power of Thor wouldn't be so significant without Loki and Tyr with his truth, wouldn't be able to manifest in other pantheons. As the god Nuadu, for example, if he didn't give his arm as deposit and for this sacrifice, he received a chance that no god of the Norse pantheon has ever received. Did I explain it clearly? It means that he can manifest himself, he has received the right to bring his program to a completion, but this time in this other pantheon, on this other land, amongst these other gods, with their team, yes, with that team, and so on, he received this right to manifest himself until this day for the sacrifice he made. And Heimdall, of course, from Loki's point of view, illuminated by Loki's fire, will become much more understandable as well why he can't be any other way, why he invented these five casts for people. And despite Loki's various fighting against this fact, humanity wouldn't be able to achieve the present day results in the absence of this caste division. Meaning that possibly, if this caste division didn't exist, we would not be living in a civilized world, but rather in the Middle Ages or so, although developing in a natural way, very much natural, fully natural, complete naturality, and only this division of people into castes, their harsh constriction within this framework has allowed the civilization to develop at a much faster pace. Because man had to first realize the hopelessness of the situation and only then fight against it. If he didn't realize, if there were no enemy, then they also wouldn't start fighting. But here we have an enemy, and this enemy is the system itself. And it is not Heimdall, but the system itself. Heimdall is just holding the system together. He makes sure that everything goes together. And Loki, as the fifth element, is someone who gives this process life. The system without Loki wouldn't be alive, and with him it is. It is alive until this day. In this state, in the state of Loki combined with the additional connection to the other four gods, to this entire fantastic five, you will find yourself living during the next three coming weeks. And our next session will be fully dedicated to the Vanier, the gods of nature. But before we start moving in that direction, the entire structure in an understandable relation and perception must assume its form. To assume its form as a life system, as a story that began at one point and will also come to end, although possibly it hasn't yet started and it's unclear when it will end. It is a whole another timeline. But you can, by comprehending this whole structure, in an amazingly magical way allow yourself to live at any point in time of the event developments of the Scandinavian myths. Any of them. When Loki was procuring the sword, and when they sewed shut his mouth, and when he was insulting Freya, to live in all these times, and of course, to take part in the process of Ragnarok. The last battle will define the rites, the reason why the Scandinavian gods are so great and so difficult to comprehend, is because they never provide a clear instruction in terms of how one should work. 
They say, guys, it is an extraordinary creativity always, and there is no ritual that would repeat another ritual. There is no one algorithm that would completely, letter by letter match another, preceding algorithm, thus, the way you are drawn to, the way that you feel, that would be the right way, and no one has a right to ever tell you that you are doing something incorrectly. I mean, they could, they could surely interact. They could, because Heimdall also has to revise his rules of transition from one caste to another. And he will revise them only when he and Loki make peace. You see, Heimdall's and Loki's points of view, they are two extremes. Loki says, no castes whatsoever. And Heimdall, a strict caste system. These two are two extremes. They must find some middle ground between themselves. Meaning, a way for people to transition from one caste to another and, of course, a method for people to grow into a mage or a witch. Because what we have now, the current algorithm, if you want to be a mage, follow the path of Odin. If you want to be a witch, follow the path of Loki. But what about combining the two? So, in order to combine the two, Loki and Heimdall must come to an agreement. The principles don't match. Can something incompatible be combined? This process is not over yet. They are trying, but it's not quite working, because it is being done in an unnatural way. They are trying to establish democracy through legislation. But it doesn't work that way. It can't be established by law. These sorts of things must transpire naturally. You can't do it legislatively. Eventually, they will agree.